בלה בלה בלה. בלה 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 אוקיי, אבל אני לא אומר שזה פרפקט. הלו, פלו הומנס. הלו הומנס, בוקר טוב לבוא פלייס וידאו גיימס. מי נאמר סלאנסו, ואני אהיה לך יום נערדי אגן היום. היום אני אהיה פרופוזי שבמקום של וידאו גיימס להיות... או, אני צריך לקרוא את הדנטיסטה. Today I'm going to be saying that instead of video games being narratives with just an extra dimension, so um, books are unidimensional because it's just a bunch of words, films could be seen as bi-dimensional because it's image and sound, uh, actually there's a lot more stuff but more on that on a future video, and then video games would be tri-dimensional because it's image, sound and interactivity. Well, I'm going to be saying that this interactivity actually makes the change completely fundamental and video games are not just narratives. At least most people agree that it's not. I'm mostly going to be using Gonzalo Frascas' academic works during the early noughties. But where he puts simulation as an alternative to narrative, I'm actually going to say that narrative is one of the systems being simulated. It's a, quite an extrapolation. I'm not going to delve too deeply into these ideas. I'm not going to delve too deeply into Frascas' work, since he uses simulation as the basis to do some practices that I'm not yet very comfortable with. I'm just going to put a simple solution to the problem of narrative in video games. All bibliography in the description. Before we start defining our key terms, I just want to point out that when I say simulation, I mean simulation with a capital S and not just... <laughs> Before we start defining our terms, I just want to point out that when I say simulation, I mean simulation with a capital S and not just simulation games. Good? Good. What is a narration? The key thing about narration for our purposes is that narrative is representation. That is to say, A narrative is not just a series of events, it's a representation of a series of events. Say you're telling an anecdote. First we have the events that actually happen, at least hopefully most of them did. Uh, then we have you telling that story. Now, when you tell that story, obviously the events are not happening. It's just a representation of those events uh, with words and your gestures or whatever else you might have. It's also important to keep in mind that in the middle, there's the step in which you kind of choose or filter those events through kind of like perspectives, you know, adjectives, superlatives, uh, time distortions, ebbings, whatever. It's kind of similar to the way in which when you say the word tree, you're not actually spewing a tree from your mouth. You're just using a bunch of images or sounds to represent the word tree, or at least represent what we as a society have more or less agreed to a tree not, not being is. Where the anecdote analogy breaks down, like all analogies eventually do, is that The events in an anecdote actually happened. Again, hopefully most of them did. Whereas in a fictitious story, the events are made up. They're not real. But the steps of events to story to narration still occur. More on that in a future video. But um, we're kind of good with narration, right? Cool. Uh, what is a simulation? Well, it's definitely similar to narration. And while there is some stuff that is kind of analogous to representation, uh, the key thing about simulation is that it models or uh, tests behaviors. Let's go through the steps. We're going to start with a thing, like an actual thing. We're then going to choose which bit of that thing we want to test. We're then going to set up some rules that are going to test that thing. And then we're going to need a thing to enact those rules to test that thing. Say you want to simulate a train. The source system is an actual train, but you're then going to have to choose which bit of the train you want to model. A perfect simulation of a train down to the atom is just another train. We want to know which aspects of trains are you interested in testing. Is it the conducting, the scheduling, the rise and fall of ticket prices, uh, how the bathrooms work? If you want to test how they rock up to stations and then do one, you're not going to be very accurate with your portrayal of Ticket inspectors. Anyway, after you have your experimental frame, you're going to do a model, which is basically just a bunch of rules, which is basically just a bunch of inputs and outputs. So if I change this parameter, then this happens. You're then going to take this model or rules and enact them in a simulator. Uh, for our purpose, that would be a computer or a console or a game board or even like a toy. Want to test what it's like being a conductor? Play train simulator. Want to build a ferrovile empire? Railroad tycoon is for you. Just like the aesthetics of the whole thing, 
get a model train, paint it, make it do some loops, show it off to your friends. We're good with simulation, right? Cool. Uh, before we move on, real quick, I just want to point out that in the same way that in narration, the event level stuff doesn't have to be real, in simulation, the source system doesn't have to be real. You can simulate the Lord of the Rings world or ethical consumption under capitalism, basically um, anything you can imagine. Uh, but now, yes, moving on, I just uh, want to say that all these train simulations are still telling stories. So say that you or someone else you know, irregardless of how you feel about them, is playing as Mario, the player avatar from the very famous game by Nintendo Super Mario Bros. And uh, narratively speaking, Mario saves the princess, but you as a player, you don't save squat. Uh, you basically just get to the end of the level. In this 1985 game, getting to the end of the level represents you saving the princess, while in turn these pixels and sounds or whatever represent the Mario saves the princess event. The latter always happens in narratives, but the former, this extra level of representation, that's occurring at the simulation level. That's the modeling. That's the simulation deciding what part of the source system is going to be modeled, specifically which part of the story is going to be modeled. So basically the game simulates the narrative while this in turn represents the event. Like um, the simulation isn't interested in testing how you interact with Peach. It only cares about how you interact with the world up until the point that you get to just outside of the castle. Meanwhile, the narration is interested in representing the Mario saves the princess or tries to save the princess event. Like the Mario pixels approach and interact with the Peach pixels or the Toad pixels. Um, basically, the narration cares, the simulation doesn't so much. Another thing that I want to point out kind of unnecessarily is that while the story level event stuff is happening real time as the player is interacting with the world or testing the model or whatever, um, the narration itself, the narration proper, kind of only occurs retroactively. It's a retro narration. That is to say, the story that video games are telling kind of happen without all the bits that don't count, like all the times you lose. So basically you take a playthrough, you ignore from low to lose state, and then you add uh, cutscenes and lore and all that stuff. Um, I'm gonna call this the narrative session. I'm not sure if I read that somewhere I came up with it. If you know where it's from, please let me know in the comments. So that session kind of exists in opposition to, but not really, the ludic session, which is your actual personal experience with the game and includes all the times you died. And it can also include like real life stuff of you banging the keyboard against the table or whatever. I should maybe actually call it the Padia session. Actually, just to point out real quick, don't confuse the ludic session with Frasca's use of the word ludus. When he uses ludus, he's actually referring to the ludus rules, which are the rules that dictate the win state and the lose state of a game in opposition to the paedia rules, which are the rules that dictate how the world behaves. Why I care about sessions and narrations, and simulations and all that is because I think it's interesting to think of video games not at first just telling a story, but rather that the stories are outputs of the game as a whole. The player is not so much creating a story as she is choosing from a finite and, in the great scheme of things, limited set of events coded by the designers. These two things are not actually mutually exclusive, but uh, more on that on a future video. Think of Space Invaders. Does it actually matter that they're aliens? Would it not be ostensibly the same game if they were like robots or even like a fire truck that's just putting out fires? Like, I don't know. I think it might be interesting for readers, players, or designers of video games to actually think about these like extra level of representation or perspective or abstraction or whatever. And um, think of what's important to the game and what's not important to the game and not necessarily what's important and not important to the story at first. Um, Extra Credits recently did a video about non-important stories. And when it comes to these stories, we can start asking, is this a good simulation of that narrative? And obviously by good, I don't mean just that it's like accurate or realistic or whatever. I mean, are the affects or feelings that the designers intend of the game being portrayed properly? Just two asterisks. 
Uh, the first one being, I'm not super big on the thorough intent of video games, just because they're such a fluid medium. I think all forms of approaching video game are pretty legitimate, um, at least hopefully most. Uh, secondly, when I say affect or feeling, I mean literally any reaction that you can get from a game. Like this includes frustration, zen, uh, numbness, but also like just muscle memory, like very twitchy stuff as well, etc, etc. I also think that most players and designers intuitively think of games like this. Uh, I'm just sort of formalizing the language. Anyway, well, I think it's okay for Mario to not actually go through the motions of interacting with Peach, for this video at least. I don't think it's okay for like, you, you remember that scene, the press F to pay respect scene in COD. So as I was editing, I realized that the point of this clip, which I hadn't actually seen during the research and scripting phase, was the shock value of after pressing F, twist, the avatar is an amputee. That being said, the criticism I was about to embark on would have stood. Well, that level of failure occurs at the simulation level. That failure being how pressing F is not a good simulation of a funeral narrative. And that would have been fine. The problem is, again, during the editing phase, I lost quite a bit of footage. Uh, there was some syncing problems. I got hit by a car. There was like a very clear drop in energy at the end. So here we are. And I really didn't want to do this. Not because I think it's BAD bad, but I'm just not very fluent in the language of metaness. I don't know what it can say and represent, let alone what I would want to say with it. So here we are. Let's make the most of it. After all these technical problems, I go to the pub because I'm really frustrated, meet up with some friends. I explain the premise of the video to one of them. And then they're like, oh, you mean like RPGs? And then I'm like, uh, yes, like RPGs. And they're an interesting case study. See, like uh, Mario is not too complicated to analyze from this, you know, simulation narration perspective because it doesn't have a lot of events. Both the simulation and the narration are not overly complex. But then you take something like Skyrim and then you have like main quest, side quest, uh, dialogue interfaces, all different types of NPCs, uh, animals, all kind of doing their own thing. So all these pseudo-independent and very pseudo-independent uh, systems are kind of creating all these events and working-ish together to create a narrative system. Small aside, the narrative system isn't necessarily formally in the code, but it's still an independent system that you can analyze. Uh, more on that in a future video. Also in that video, um, the narrative system isn't the narrative itself, it's just the system that outputs the narrative. All right, so you know games like um, Skyrim was definitely guilty of this. Watch Dogs was very, very guilty of this, that are like, oh my God, the world is burning. Um, here you go, do some very menial side missions. I clearly remember playing Watch Dogs and some baddies uh, kidnapped or woman in the fridge to my sister. And I was like, oh, well, I gotta go do this now. I mean, surely this is the final mission. I mean, I'm not gonna be able to go out and play Candy Crush or whatever, but alas, no, you can do anything you want. You can go play Candy Crush or whatever their equivalent is. And for me, that's kind of a failure of the narrative system. That is to say, the simulation of the narration. Like, a story can do whatever it wants, it's its own thing. But the affects being portrayed by giving us the chance to do that are just not coherent. Look, they're trying to tell a story, a very specific kind of story with very well-known cultural signifiers, a uh, type of genre, and that's just not it. And there are games that are like, oh, no worries. Um, the world isn't burning just yet. You can go help some villagers while you help yourself buff up for when you have to fight the alien robot dragon queen or whatever. Then you have games like graphic novels or um, puzzle light story heavy adventure games like the Telltale stuff, which is like, you can be more or less fond of their actual plot lines and like narrative beats and stuff. But in general, as simulations of narrations, they work really well because it's, it's their bread and butter and they normally take you on a pretty coherent, closely knit journey. I mean, they're basically choose your own adventure book, but more on that on a possible video on Espen Arset's uh, cybertext. Then you have games that focus on emergent narrative like Dwarf Fortress or The Sims. By the way, Frasca loves talking about The Sims. Um, and they do a pretty fantastic job of simulating narratives because all the systems in these games go out of their way to create interesting and engaging narratives. I'm going to leave that there because I'm going to do an extensive look at emergent narratives in a future video. 
And look, I just want to disclaim about all the stuff I've been saying that I'm not trying to make any true statements. I'm basically introducing an interesting way of analysis. You can analyze stuff with uh, computational theory, I don't know, um, feminist theory, critical theory, uh, logic, physics, anthropology, uh, whatever. Psychoanalysis, I guess, if you want to. Basically, different tools for analysis are going to give you different results. Um, and all of them, maybe not as useful, but definitely as legit. At least most of them. Uh, so, go nuts. I guess this is kind of the little narratology stuff, but um, most people are kind of over that. Plus, I'm saying that the narrative system is kind of at the same level as the Ludus or Paedia or any other mechanical system. I'm not so much hierarchizing them as I'm saying they feed off each other. If you want to know more on that, then stay tuned because I'm gonna have a video where I introduce a new methodology for video game criticism that's uh, loosely based on the loser's rhizomes, but that's in the far, far future. Uh, closer stuff will be video games as performance, where the narrator lies in video games, what Nazis and zombies actually represent in video games, emergent narratives, obviously, why rhythm games aren't really music games. I'm also going to expand on some of the ideas presented by Heather Alexandra on her mini crit series, as well as some stuff by um, Aaron Signal, like um, the Win State video. So if any of that sounds appealing to you, please subscribe. Otherwise, please do press like, because it's like um, no effort and it does help me out a lot. I have set up a Patreon, so if you can and want, please do support me financially through this coherent journey of academic-y video -logy stuff. Um, heads up, some of the videos will be in Spanish. Please don't be a dick in the comments. Thank you for sticking all the way to the end, and I will see you beautiful humans later.